Hello friends, welcome to Study IQ. My name is Dr. Mahipal Singh Rathod and in this video I will be discussing the industrial revolution with you. This topic is very important for UPSC mains examination. In fact, the world history syllabus starts from industrial revolution because we have to study the world history only from 18th century onwards and in 18th century the most important event in the world was the industrial revolution. For MCQs that is in prelims you can expect uh, almost no questions from this topic because this is mainly an analytical topic all the questions that can be framed from this are mostly analytical in nature but if you are giving some other examinations you can see that there will be questions from inventions that happened during the industrial revolution so we will discuss them here before beginning let me tell you that study IQs pen drive and tablet courses are available for SSC bank all government examinations and UPSC IAS we also have a test series that is available for UPSC prelims which is both in Hindi and English. If you want to know the details about all these courses you can visit our website studyiq.com or if you have any doubt still remaining call on these numbers. The first question that comes to our mind is what exactly is industrial revolution? How will you define it? Industrial revolution was the transition to new manufacturing processes from about 1760 to 1870 it brought radical changes to the world. You can say the roughly time period was from the middle of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century, middle or later part of the 19th century. Now why is this called a revolution? Just like the French and the American revolutions, which brought about a vast change in the polity and the governing structure of the country, the industrial revolution also brought some great changes in the structure of how things are made, of how manufacturing is done, how technology is used. Earlier, everything that was built in this world was built using hands. It was all hand production. If somewhere in uh, England, if someone was making clothes, then they were hand spun using machine, very rudimentary or basic machines were used and mostly everything was done from hands. Later on, during industrial revolution, machines started to be used for production. New chemical manufacturing processes were started. New chemicals were developed. The development of science and technology took place. It took great strides during this industrial revolution. Iron production started commercially. There was increase in the use of steam power. We will talk about steam power and the engine made by James Watt. The development of machine tools and the rise of factory system. So these are the major characteristics of the industrial revolution. What changed? I have highlighted all those. Where did this industrial revolution take place? It took place first of all in England and later it spread to France, Germany, Netherlands, Austro-Hungary and other nations and empires like Russia, Japan. So firstly it was the European countries or the European nations empires that were industrialized. Later on it came to Asia. Japan was one of the first Asian nations to be industrialized and slowly it has spread to most of the world today. All the countries in the world are at some level of industrial development in their cycle. Some are highly developed, which uh, which we term as the developed nations. They were they are developed because of this industrial revolution, because they had their industrial revolution before the developing countries. And that is why many other countries are still developing or they are yet to begin the industrial phase, which are very backward. This industrial revolution is continuing till this day in many ways. I will, I will also discuss this, that how there are different phases of industrial revolution. Now let us talk a little about the life of humans in the preceding millennia, in the preceding 10,000 years or so since the time agriculture has begun, farming was the main occupation of majority of the people. About 80 to 90% of the human population was doing farming. Why? It was necessary. They did not have anything to eat. If you did not farm, you did not have anything to eat. Mostly people grew whatever they ate. So that is why they lived close to their food sources. Almost everyone lived on their farms and the cities were very small. You won't see any large cities in ancient period because of this limitation. Food could not be transported. There was hardly any transportation network available or modes to transport food from the villages to the cities. Whatever cities did develop, they were mostly in fertile plains where food could be relatively easily transferred. That is why you see all the major Indian cities of ancient period, they are mostly in the fertile plains area. Anywhere in the world you can see that. And the size of the city was always limited to the food source. So you will never see cities having population of 1 crore or 50 lakh in the ancient period. Although 
villages did although the country did have a good population but there were no large cities unlike today industrial revolution changed everything now we have hundreds of cities in the world that have population over 5 million 3 million and even in india we have so many cities that have crossed the threshold of 10 million citizens so that was not possible earlier now it is possible after the industrial revolution all the commodities that were produced were local foreign goods were a rare luxury so if you used anything in your home that was 99% chances were that was made locally in the same village where you lived getting goods from foreign was a rare luxury only kings could afford for example persian carpets not everyone could get a persian carpet it took 2 to 3 months for something to reach from persia to india it was a very dangerous journey it was not very profitable trade that is why they were very costly and only kings or nawabs could afford it now even you can go to the supermarket and go buy a persian carpet that is how life has changed for you you want to buy a television made in japan or a ceramic bowl made in china everything is available in your city today it is all because of this industrial revolution now earlier the production of goods was for use not for profit not for selling for example if there was an iron smith living in a village and there was the requirement of let's say 10 utensils in that village every year so he will make only 10 or 11 utensils he will not make 100 and think that okay 10 will be used in my village 90 i can sell somewhere else this we do today earlier no one used to do this because to so, uh, sell those 90 utensils that person has to take those 90 utensils with him travel to some other villages other cities it will take up his time he will not be able to do his other work and it was just not possible because there were no roads no fast transportation networks during monsoons or during winters roads might be closed so that is why everyone used to make things only for use if there is a if there's a potter in a village he will make only so many pots that will be used in the village nothing was for profit it is all for use of people and then there were no modern weapons that could kill thousands of people the weapons were mainly rudimentary like swords or old type of muskets or gun uh, they could kill hardly four or five people or six people if you are very good with them so there were no weapons of mass destruction as well this was there in the preceding millennia now after industrial revolution the weapons have also undergone a huge change uh, the weapons development also was one of the important aspects of this industrial revolution life expectancy earlier was only 35 years there were hardly any health facilities we did not know about antibiotics uh, more than 100 years ago so life any a small infection a cut that is gotten infected that could kill you so if someone reached the age of 35 it was considered okay that okay now he has lived a full life that is why people married earlier they they had children earlier nowadays basic life expectancies even in country like india is 70 years it could be more in other countries so now people take everything slowly they spend time on education they will marry later and they will have their kids later as well so society also has changed because of industrial revolution not just manufacturing but even society has impact been impacted travel and communication between far off places was either non existent or extremely slow someone living in himachal pradesh it is very it was very rare that that person would ever come down to the plains in his lifetime it were there were only few people who traveled so much that is why those who traveled became famous like marco polo ibn batuta these people are famous because they did travel large distances and it took them years and decades for their journeys to complete so if you want to send some news across that also took a long time distance between delhi and agra is 200 kilometers and any message that has to be sent to agra usually took 2 days because it would take someone at least one day to tra- uh, travel 100 kilometers on a horseback so that was the speed of communication today what you want to do uh, if you what do you do if you want to send a message across uh, 200 kilometers you just text them so then we had pigeons people used pigeons to send messages across now due to industrial revolution the machine manufacturing the assembly line productions we have modern day machines we have modern day cell phones that help us that enable us to send messages to communicate so that the world has become a small village in itself this is the impact of ed- uh, industrial revolution that i want to tell you transportation what what was the best mode of transportation this was it either a bullock cart or a horse cart now we have an driverless truck that is doing that is doing testing so this is the auto truck by uber and there is not even not even a single driver in it so this is an automatic driverless truck so this is what the world world has come to 
you want to send something uh, 1000 kilometers away it can reach there in one day and if you send it by aeroplane it is it will be there in less than one day on the other hand 300 years ago if you wanted to send something 1000 kilometers at least 20 to 30 days minimum next see the production what used to be there in textile industry all these charkhas or hand spun uh, instruments that were used now we have completely mechanized power looms not even a single person is required to operate this everything is computerized or it can be operated from direct control rooms now we will come to the factors that led to the industrial revolution in england specifically at that time england was not poised to be an industrial powerhouse in the middle ages in the ancient period china and india were the most important manufacturing hubs of the world most of the gdp of the world was from these two places europe was not a manufacturing hub china had been the home of discoveries and inve- inventions like paper gunpowder so many things had been invented in china india was the hub of textile industry in the entire world and many other goods and uh, goods were manufactured here but still the uh, industrial revolution hit england and not china and india so we will discuss some reasons for that The first one is the agricultural surplus in England in the 17th century. This is also known as the agricultural revolution. Remember this term it is very important agricultural revolution preceded the industrial revolution. So first came the agricultural revolutions how in the 16th and the 17th century some new techniques were adopted by farmers in England. There was a new cropping pattern what we follow today the rotation of crops so that the land has not to be left for a year or two to regen so that the nutrients are regenerated no the rotational crop farming was started then there were some new types of plows that was invented uh, some new other instruments for farming were invented this all led to the increase in farm production also when the techniques improved fewer people were required to work in agriculture so some people started migrating those who were skilled they wanted to go to other places where their skills could be put to better use like a city so that is how there was a semi skilled workforce also available readily available now these semi skilled workers they were further trained to operate machines and that is how this workforce was available for the industrial revolution second is mercantilism mercantilism is a philosophy that started around 15th 16th century and it was continued till 18th century it means trading for profit mercantilism basically means trading for a profit it is different from the previous theory that make things only for the use of the village or the city no mercantilism means make as many things as you can sell them to other countries so that your country accumulates wealth this was the basic philosophy or the basic funda of mercantilism try to get as much as gold and silver as possible in your country and try to sell as much products that are made in your country to other countries that is what mercantilism was and it operate and this principle operated for 200 to 300 years everyone tried to get most wealth out of other nations into their nations all right so this mercantilism this free flowing trade also helped industrial revolution because when the industrial revolution brought so many manufactured goods there was already already a network of traders who could sell these to the other markets other countries of uh, north america asia there were already as well established well established trade routes and trade networks then there is the long coastline of england england is an island uh, and it is part of the british isles no region is far away from a seaport so whenever the raw materials came in they they could be easily transported another facility was that there are a lot of swift flowing rivers so once the ship reaches a seaport then the material could be loaded onto smaller boats and via rivers they could be transported to inland in cities like manchester where easily uh, factories could have access to raw materials then there was the abundance of coal and iron this could be the single most important factor in industrial revolution happening in england england was naturally endowed with a lot of coal and iron and it was an initial pioneer in this field as well they realized very early that we have coal and iron and we have to make good use of it especially coal a government that encouraged improvements in transportation and used its navy to protect british trade that is also that is also a reason why england had industrial revolution the government did not actively propose a policy that yes we have to have an industrial revolution it was not like the green revolution in india where the government actively tried that yes we want to improve the farming production and we will put on some new technologies for that this happened by chance it happened by chance but the government tried to provide a smooth path to the industrial revolution by improving transportation networks like roads 
like canals and seaports. So that is how the government also helped. Then the administrative and military expenditure of England was lower than the other monarchies of Europe, especially like France. The English uh, kings did not spend so much. They were not very lavish. Even the government was very frugal compared to other European monarchies. So there was not much expense on the running of the government. That is why England could have better tax rates. If you are not spending so much, you don't need so much of money and the tax could be better managed. That is why they taxed the industrialists or the mercantilists very low and most of the people in England want to do trade. If you go to other monarchies at that time, there, there was a very heavy taxation system which did not allow entrepreneurs to flourish. Then there was the resource in the form of colonies, especially India, from where you could get cheap raw materials and ready markets. India was the biggest source of raw cotton for England and in fact the textile industry was one of the first to be industrialized so that was a big help the resource in the form of colonies later on even the colonies in North America and Africa Africa was mainly colonized because of this industrial revolution they wanted more and more raw materials then comes the scientific inventions there were a lot of scientific inventions especially in chemistry new chemicals were made and all these were facilitated and promoted by societies like the, the Royal Society of London then comes the bank and the banking system. Banking began in about 13th century in Italy. So initially the banking system began in Italy but slowly it came to England, Netherlands uh, and these countries flourished. Now there were loans available if you want to start an industry, if you want to start a trade, you want to start a business, there is a loan available readily which is not at a very high interest rate. Okay. Then there are strong property laws and political institutions. The property law in England was favorable towards industrialists. So if you are setting up a factory and industry, you are spending money in putting machines in your industry, then the government will reward you. They cannot simply be taken away from you. The laws are in your favor. Then there were political institutions. England has had a parliament since many centuries. So that parliament had a lobby. All these in in industrialists could lobby the parliament to make laws favorable for the, their industries. So that is how these political institutions also helped. Other countries were absolute monarchies, especially France. There was no chance of any lobbying. That is why China, India, these countries could not have an industrial revolution. This, all, this also could be one of the factors. I think there will be a question asked soon enough that why did China or India did not have an industrial revolution. So prepare yourself accordingly. You can write that answer also. I'm giving you points, write them down. Then there was a low population of England. See, in the preceding years, before this uh, 18th century, in the 15th and the 16th century, there were a large number of deaths in England. Earlier in the 14th century, there was the Black Death, that is plague. Plague had killed almost one third of the population of Europe at one point of time. Then there were some great fire tragedies in England. All these had contributed to population decline and thus there was low population. Now, whenever the population is low, there are less number of people available for labor, the cost of labor will go up, it will rise. So how did this high cost of labor help industrial revolution? Let's say there is a factory owner who employs 10 workers. He has to pay them 100 every day, which means 1000 into 30. So 30,000 is his expense every month on just on labor. So he thought, why not should I get a machine that even if it costs 50 or 50,000 or even 1 lakh, why not get the machine instead of hiring so many people so that my profit is more in the long run. So what does what did this person do? This factory owner went to a scientist or a innovator and he will ask them that give me a machine, make a machine for me so that my process is faster. It will be efficient and I can earn more profits. They held open competitions, large, big factory owners. They held open competitions asking anyone who could innovate, make new machines for them. They will be rewarded. They will be given good prizes. And this is how there was fast pace of innovation and invention. That is the incentive to invent and adopt new machines because there was so much of in, uh, incentive from the factory owners as well as the industrialists. So talking about these inventions a little bit more, we want, I want to discuss with you those inventions that are important. They can be asked in exam sometimes, although in UPSC, I don't think they will ever ask the names or who are the inventors, but any other exam, there's a good chance that they can ask the name of the person who invented these. 
Textile industry was the first to be affected by industrial revolution. Most of these owners who gave incentives, they were textile owners, textile industry owners. And thus, this industry was the first to be completely mechanized by 1830s. By 1830, within 60 years of industrial revolution beginning in England, there was hardly any person required to operate a textile uh, factory. Everything was mechanized completely. So the first invention that hit the weaving industry was John Kay's flying shuttle sometime around 1760. So when industrial revolution began, there was this flying shuttle. See, this is the flying shuttle. Even I do not know how exactly this works, but somehow this was faster than the traditional hand spinning of the yarn. So this is the flying shuttle. Then second came the spinning jenny. So this was a bigger machine and it could spin hundreds of yarns together at one time. The name is important, spinning jenny. And later, after the spinning jenny came the power loom. So this is the power loom, completely mechanized. Everything is mechanized here. You can see the, there are lots of machines in this factory. So this is how slowly development took place. New inventions came by. And there were many others. I am just naming the important ones, okay? John Kay's flying shuttle. Remember this flying shuttle, spinning jenny, and this is the power loom. So more or less, even today, this power loom is used, although it is further mechanized now. But this is the basic power loom. Next, we have to discuss the steam engine. Steam engine is one of the most important inventions of the industrial revolution period. This technology is so important that even after 250 years, this basic technology has not changed at all. Most of the steam engines that we use today are based on the same principle that what James Watt had used. See, the first steam engine was a very rudimentary one. It was used in the early 1600s to pump out water from coal mines. The, they faced the problems of flooding of the mines whenever they started to dig a little deeper. So that is why basic rudimentary steam engines were manufactured. We do not know exactly who manufactured them. But gradually, people kept on innovating. They kept on tinkering with it. And this is how James Newcomen, first of all, gave us a, the first steam engine that we can say is the forerunner of this James Watt one. Later on, after half a century, James Watt brought some changes to this new common steam engine. He added a condenser, it, uh, this, he improved its efficiency and that is how the James Watt steam engine that is used even till today was made. This is an old specimen that is kept in a museum in England somewhere. This steam engine, what does it do? For those of you who do not understand what a steam engine is, just remember it is a basic machine that will turn heat energy into mechanical energy. All you have to do is heat water the water will convert into steam and that steam will run either this wheel or pistons or shafts you can run anything it will give you mechanical movement that is what an engine does where will you get this heat energy from it could be wood it could be coal it could be anything that burns and gives heat energy even though the, those gas plants you might have heard of, of uh, electricity plants that are based on gas so what does what do they do even there the gas is burned the heat energy converts into mechanical energy. That mechanical energy later rotates some coils and then electricity is produced. So the basic technology is same. We are using it everywhere in our daily life. Now this steam engine led to other inventions and innovation. How? Someone had the idea that let us put this steam engine on wheels and have some rails like this so that we can have faster movement. So this is how a locomotive came into being. Then someone else had the idea that why not make a carriage behind this locomotive so that people can be transported from one place to another. Someone else had the idea of putting this steam engine on a boat and that is how a steam boat came into being. Do you see this wheel? So there is a steam engine running. You can see the smoke coming out and this uh, the, this mechanical energy, this will turn this wheel and these boats will move forward. So earlier, if you had to move a ship, the only ma method that you had was the, this, the sail. So these sails depended on wind energy, the direction of the wind or the ocean currents. Uh, these were the only two methods that you could, you could move a ship. But now all these are gone. You can have mechanical power. You can turn and run your ship in whichever direction you want. This is how innovations kept on happening. So this is Stephenson's rocket. In fact, uh, these, are, these photographs are also of the rocket. This was one of the first ray engines that could run properly like a locomotive of today, this day. And by 1830s, the first commercial train operation started in England. And by 1860s, most of the England, major cities of England were connected by trains. Trains were called railroads at that time. Okay. Even uh, in America, they still call them railroads. So railroads or train, they started by 1860. Now I have uh, another example for you. 
the textile industry as i told you was one of the first to be mechanized so this shows that how people are using innovative technology if you don't have steam engines what you can use is mechanical of force given by nature so this is a canal or a swift flowing river this water will turn this wheel this wheel will turn this entire mechanism on three floors so you can see there are activities happening so this cotton is being spun into a yarn then this yarn will be made into clothes so this entire factory this is what a factory typical factory looks like so this is a factory that is based on running water the mechanical energy given by running water another important invention was in the field of communication the telegraph now you have to tell me in the comment section who invented the telegraph the year was 1835 if you wanted to send a message across 100 kilometers it could take approximately one day earlier now if you want to send a message across the atlantic ocean there were telegraph lines laid down in the oceans by 1860s 1850s that message could reach from london to new york within few minutes that is the power of telegraph another invention the common sewing machine that uh, you can see even in our homes uh, many of you might have this sewing machine although it looks different but you can recognize this part right some of it looks like this so this is the one of the first models that was filed in a patent office in 1846 the sewing machine so that the sewing process it could take place in everyone's home Every, anyone could sew now they could make clothes they could stitch clothes after these inventions i will not talk about the importance of coal in industrial revolution coal personally according to me this is the single most important factor in industrial revolution and uh, let me tell you why first was that coal was abundant in england england was lucky in that manner it is abundant in england and today it is abundant in china okay at that i mean coal was already there in china but it was a, a bit deeper so it was not very readily accessible in england why they were lucky because all the coal was near the surface and that is why whenever they dug the surface the coal was found very nearby they did not have to go very deep the technology for building deep mines came to us later because of the industrial revolution earlier it was not possible to dig very much deeper this coal is way cheaper than other heat sources like wood and also forests in england were being depleted by continuous use over the centuries for heating up for heating purposes for cooking and uh, building coal uh, building iron etc why is coal cheaper because it is easily available near the surface and coal is an excellent source of heat the only problem now with coal is the pollution it gives away the pollution is a big problem but at that time pollution was not there this coal only brought about the pollution problem to us rudimentary steam engines were first invented to pump water out of the coal mines as i told you earlier now these rudimentary steam engines were further improved because as the mines were becoming bigger the mines were getting larger they wanted more efficient engines so that is why people kept on innovating on that same steam engine and ultimately newcomen made the steam engine so these designs were improved later so the first use where the the steam engine was used was in a coal mine then lastly the production of coal gave an impetus to iron production see iron requires a very high temperature if you are burning wood to make iron from the iron ore you will it will take a lot of wood to burn it but since coal is a more efficient source of heat it will take less coal to make iron that is why because of the coal revolution iron production could be taken up at commercial level and when iron is available commercially in large quantities it could be put to other use like making machines making trains and any other industrial equipment today if you go to a factory you will see most mostly everything is made of iron iron or steel so first iron was made at commercial level later on the technology for making steel came in the 19th century now let us talk about the impact of the industrial revolution remember the impact was not only on industries or factories the impact was felt in every sphere of life the social life the political uh, the political life the political institutions it gave rise to new philosophies new movements and it changed the entire course of human civilization just to give you an idea of the impact if you took someone from 200 bc or even 2000 bc you put this man in a time machine and you transported him to 1600 and 90 or let's say 1700 ad you transported him 4000 or 3700 years ahead he would not feel much of a difference the life was more or less same people use the same uh, utensils the people use the same pots their daily life was same they did not have any machines but if you transport the same man from 2000 bc to 1800 ad just 100 years difference 
and in between this time the industrial revolution took place this person would be bewildered he could not recognize he would not recognize his own city he would not recognize 90% of the equipment that people are using that is how life has changed and if you transport this man today to 2000 ad or let's say 2020 i think he would go mad he would not recognize what an ipad is or what uh, this digital technology of video calling is it it is just impossible this is the stuff of mythology that telepathy is happening between gods and now we have telepathy we have video calling between any person sitting anywhere on the planet so this is how the impact of this is the impact of industrial revolution on our human race now let us begin with the positive impacts first of all so the first positive impact was the factory system what is the factory system earlier if a family was making carpets they used to do it in their home and it was not a very professional setup but now the factory system came into being remember this factory system did not begin during the industrial revolution it was it started before it but it was made more efficient due to the factory system in in a factory all the families come together they sit in one place and they divide the work now everyone is not making the carpet someone is procuring the raw materials someone is doing the weaving work someone is doing the decorative work and someone else will be going for the marketing and selling of the product so this is a factory system where work is divided and everyone comes together at one place to work this was not there earlier it started somewhere around the industrial revolution only and the industrial revolution made it more efficient now earlier people used to sit and work at that one place after machines came all those machines came into the factory and thus the process were more standardized and it was more efficient so our next point is the standardization of factory work methods and processes and this enabled us to mass to make massive production quantities for example if you are buying an iphone in india or in china or in usa the iphone is exactly the same there is no difference in the build quality the screen size or the finish of the product you expect that today earlier it was not so if in 16th century someone is buying a persian carpet and after 2 years he comes to buy the same carpet there will be some variation not everything will be same because the work is done by hand there could be changes in raw materials there could be change in the person who is making the carpet so the design the technique would vary although it is made by the same person even the same family or even in the same factory still there could be variations in it earlier if you went to your local potter and asked him for a 10 liter pot you would not have been sure whether it is 9 liter 9.5 it could be 11 liter because there are variations in the manufacturing process but now if you go to the market and you want to buy a 10 liter can you are sure you are absolutely sure that this is 10 liter this would be 10 liter because the process had has been standardized now you do not expect that 10 liter can to be 11 liter those companies do not survive in the market that do such a shoddy job so this standardization of factory work methods and processes is very important okay and this leads to massive production quantities third is the means of communication and transportation the telegraph later the telephone and now the internet technology all this has brought a revolution in communication and transportation railroads buses everything that is made up of iron first came the steam engine it's used in locomotives then at the end of around 19th century rudolf diesel made a diesel engine and that was put in smaller vehicles on the road so that is how cars came into being now a person did not require one day to travel 100 kilometers 100 kilometers could be done in one hour or two hours simply next are the roads bridges railway tracks canal that is the transport infrastructure this is also related to the transportation only these were built by england's government initially and now every country tries to build them wherever you want industrial revolution the country has to build good roads and good railway tracks so now all the countries most of the developed and the developing countries have a good road or railway network at least and it is there for transport of goods of raw materials and also for the travel of common man for common people next is the urbanization industrial revolution has led to large number of people coming to the cities staying there and to let those people have a decent standard of living governments were forced to provide them clean water with sewerage systems with public transport so whatever you see in your cities around today it is all because of the industrial revolution that these systems have come into being when thousands and lakhs of people started living in one place they could not live like the medieval cities where there were no pub- where there was no clean water no sewerage nothing no public transport it was not possible to have such old cities new designs new technologies suburbs downtown all these terms came into being 
cities expanded exponentially then there was no more hunger or famine people did not die because of shortage of food because now wherever there is shortage there could be surplus food transported from other regions where there was excess food if there is uh, there is drought in england then food could be transported from france to england if there is drought in one part of india today the fci or the government they transport food stock from one place to the drought hit regions mostly so this hunger and famine people dying of hunger or famine is now unheard of in india lakhs of people used to die millions people millions of people used to die because of famine earlier mainly it, it was because of the administrative policies of the british but also due to the lack of transportation the lack of networks to transport now this is not happening anymore to give you an example of the communication network in the world today this is a map showing the underwater sea cables that connect the entire world so firstly they lay down the they, they laid down the telegraph lines in the middle of the 19th century to connect north america to europe so all these telegraph lines were laid down but now these telegraph lines have been supplemented with optic fiber cables that connect your internet so if there is a cyclone sometime or if there is some other damage to these lines the internet of entire country shuts down you might have read about these in the newspaper that the, uh, the that some cable has been cut in indian ocean and that is why entire maharashtra or gujarat is not receiving internet so this happens now sometimes especially during cyclones or in any other climactic events then the negative effects we have to discuss the negatives along with the positives the first negative is capitalism now this is a gray area you can either call capitalism a negative or you can also call it positive depends on how you think what is the effect in that particular country what is capitalism first of all it is the philosophy of profit maximization where the resources of production are owned and controlled by a few if you want to know about detail about all these philosophies uh, capitalism communism i have discussed them in a separate video you can find it in the history playlist please go watch that you will understand all these philosophies in detail now capitalism came because of industrial revolution what does capitalism believe get maximum profit it is like mercantilism but unlike trade here it is production here it is factory production so this capitalism came because of industrial revolution next was the exploitation of workers this was a huge social problem there were long working hours there was no restriction on working hours of the uh, workers they used to work for 16 to 18 hours imagine nowadays usually people work for 7 to 8 hours earlier when industrial revolution began when there were no re laws no regulations nothing the owners used to make them work for 16 to 18 hours without any protect protective gear without any proper breaks nothing the con conditions in factories were often hazardous especially in chemical manufacturing etc and the conditions living conditions in the homes of these workers were unhygienic because there was no sewerage system earlier there was no clean drinking water so sanitation suffered and that is why there were a lot of epidemics like cholera cholera used to kill people by the thousands every time it spread in a city and due to these deaths these unhygienic living and working conditions the government started to make sewerage systems clean water supply have started that is how the modern cities came into being and uh, so many people coming to live in a city it also brought about the problem of slum now all these slums had unhygienic living conditions because there was very less space all these people were crammed into less space so the quality of life did suffer then the traditional weavers and workers were wiped out by the machines they could not compete with the machine produced goods because the rate of those machine produced goods were was very low another example here in india there was a tradition of building wooden combs or a kanghi so these wooden combs are costly to build because they are handmade there is wood in it so it will cost you somewhere around 200 to 300 rupees to get a wooden comb but after the advent of plastic combs no one buys these why because you can get a plastic comb for 20 or 50 40 rupees in 50 rupees you will get a very good plastic comb so why would you spend 200 to 300 rupees on a wooden comb that is why the people who used to make these wooden combs are out of business now they have started some other work and maybe now they have started other works but initially when this industrial revolution came to india i mean these manufactured goods came to india they were just devastated and this is just one example it happened with each and every industry each and every traditional handicrafts next was the problem of child labor the factory owners soon realized that it was cheaper to employ children and also women because you have to pay them less secondly children could be abused children could be slapped 
they could be made to do any work by uh, terrifying uh, them from dire consequences and that is why a large number of workforce in in the industrial revolution it comprised of children there is no other word for it it was plain and simple child abuse so this child abuse went for a long time and even the first factory acts that came around in 1830s the factory act said said that it was okay if the children are working just make them work for 14 hours or 12 hours that's it don't make them work for 16 18 hours so this was the kind of apathy for children shown by the government by the legislators i told you these industrialists had a strong lobby the factory owners had a strong lobby in the parliament later on the factory acts they d- demanded that children should not be allowed to work and this child abuse should stop but an entire generation in england came up like this those children were working in factories for hours and hours and you cannot even imagine how their childhood would have been like next is the demand for colonial expansion because there was more and more requirement of raw materials there was more and more demand for colonies by 19th century most of the southern asia southeast asia africa had been colonized by european nations because they wanted more raw power more raw materials for their industrial revolutions then there was the deindustrialization of colonies like india india was a thriving center of textile production india china all these countries had a long tradition of textile production but by the industrial revolution and uh, at the same time india was being colonized by when this industrial revolution started this was the same time when bengal was taken over by the east india company so both of these events happened side by side and thus they deindustrialized india completely how whatever textile goods were manufactured whatever cloth is manufactured in india when it was exported to london to england there was a huge import duty put upon it so that cloth coming from india is now expensive no one will buy it in london on the other hand by industrial revolution starting here the cloth that is produced in manchester manchester was one of the most important centers of textile revolution the cloth from manchester is now cheaper than the cloth from india earlier it was not like this earlier the indian cloth was cheaper and before industrial revolution because everything was handmade in england it was costly there now the situation is reversing by putting the import duties first they made the indian cloth expensive second what they did was they colonized india they got all the raw materials from india to england now there is no raw material for indian factories remaining all the cotton is being loaded on ships it is being sent to manchester now what will the mills in bombay do there is nothing to produce there is no raw material so that is how deindustrialization of entire nations took place then there was the issue of population increase growth uh, the population increase led to the growth of slums because more and more people less and less space also after a long time low uh, high population ultimately leads to low wages so when industrial revolution began the wages were very high there was an incentive to bring machines later on the wages became very low so there was exploitation of workers as well to give you an idea of the europe's population it was 140 million that is 14 crore in 1750 by the time world war 1 began in 1914 within 160 years the increase has been three times so this was 463 million that is roughly around 50 crore that was the population of europe then came the problem of pollution no one realized it at that time but the burning of coal all these factories they were emitting harmful gases and later it became a health and environment concern people hated living in the cities because of all the smoke those who could afford it they started moving away from the cities they were the mostly they were the rich people not a common man could not afford to do that a worker could not afford to do it but this pollution has been a major issue such a major issue that even after 250 years whenever there is a climate deal that is being negotiated by the members of the UNFCC this issue comes to the front that you have had your industrial revolution for the past 250 years you have had your opportunity the developed the developed nations now india china they want their industrial revolution time they want to pollute so that they can reach up to that level that is the main concern of india and china that is why you know that they have been given time till 2035 after that india and china are going to reduce their emissions on the other hand us and uk they are eu european union they are reducing their emissions right now starting 2020 somewhere around 2020 they are reducing their emissions so this is some leeway given to these countries in the paris climate deal then come the comes the dominance of european nations this is a point relating to the international affairs or the political history of 1920th century 
now european nations because they became powerful after industrial revolution so much growth has taken place they have modern weapons they have money they started dominating the world affairs they started colonizing the entire world now depending on which country you live in this could be a positive or a negative point it was obviously negative for indians because england's domination of over india lasted for more than uh, 150 years and uh, it led to disastrous consequences for indians at least but if you are living in england you are a british citizen maybe you consider this is a positive point then comes the social aspect of the industrial revolution now it gave rise to a new industrial class structure what was there earlier there was just two classes upper class that is all the king and the nobles and the aristocrats then there was the lower class it comprised of the farmers the workers and everyone else after industrial revolution there started a middle class so this is the new middle class it could it was the owners of the factories those people who who started uh, those factories they invested in the factories they were traders now they were doctors they were professionals they were uh, lawyers they started this new middle class they had good money enough to get by to have a very good lifestyle but not as good as the king and the nobles even at this point of time during the industrial revolution the nobles had the best lifestyle because they had traditionally more money then now there was this lower middle class or the new working class as it is called the classification could be different depending on the country but this is a very rough classification okay so this new working class was the workers in the factory they had just enough money to get by to have a decent living to provide food for their family and not much else after discussing the positive and the negative points i will talk about socialism the many negative impacts of industrial revolution led to the growth of a different strand of thinking in the society that was socialism somewhere in the middle of the 19th century many writers started believing that capitalism and industrial revolution is flawed this model is wrong when the means of production are in the hands of a few society cannot progress they said that a new model is required so they brought socialism a model which believed in equality where people collectively owned and controlled the means of production and the distribution most importantly the distribution of results is proportional out of socialism grew marxism and later from marxism came out communism which was adopted by many countries like the ussr china cuba in the 20th century and this communism was strong for 50 to 70 years but later on no system is perfect so it was found out that even communism has its flaws and now most of the countries in the world they follow a mixture of capitalism and socialistic policies and all this you can see in my video of capitalism socialism i have discussed it there so you can write it as a positive as well as a negative point it depends on you how you think like what is your thinking okay your analysis is also very important i am giving you the facts but you have to analyze them and put them in a structured manner now we come to the phases of industrial revolution the first or the classic phase was from 1760 to 1850 this was led by the mechanism mechanization of textile industry the first industry to be completely mechanized mining and metallurgy saw a lot of developments steam engine was developed one of the most important inventions of the industrial revolution and its application in transport that is trains locomotives all this happened in the first phase after that started the second phase second phase started in late 19th century and this stage scientific inventions took center stage earlier also science was important but now most of the new things that are coming are based on science new chemicals are being invented steel the men, from iron we have moved on to steel we have moved on to stainless steel now new chemicals like ammonia started were started to be manufactured in factories that ammonia could be used for making fertilizers and many other things there was growth of mass production that is assembly lines began and this phase was led by usa and germany which was the country in this phase the leader was england england and later even the low countries that is the netherlands holland uh, the, these countries were the leaders of the first phase in the second phase usa and germany led the world they started this assembly lines or mass production techniques so see here this is a photograph from uh, the ford factory in the early 1910 henry ford started this company called ford you might have heard of it it still makes cars they started making the t model and they started making it on a assembly line what do you mean by an assembly line see this is a long line on which cars are coming one person will fit the tire here another person will fit the glass someone else will paint this car here then another person will put on the headlight and this assembly line will keep on moving it is like a conveyor belt so not everyone is working at the same place this is an assembly line method of production and this led to faster production more efficient production 
this is what is called an assembly line um, or a mass production assembly line this made industrial revolution more efficient now we come to the third phase of industrial revolution this started in the late 20th century and it is still ongoing now the third phase is important because of its communication technology the internet which has revolutionized the world clean energy different sources of energy now we do not want to depend on coal we are looking for cleaner alternatives like solar energy hydel geothermal etc robotics is an important aspect remember this factory of ford now all these people are replaced by robotics try to watch a video of any car production in any factory you will see that all this these things are done by robots now a robot arm will fix a tire a robot arm will paint the car so robotics has brought a revolution as well then there is a digitization of manufacturing now we have 3d printers you can start a factory in your home bring a 3d printer start manufacturing something start an assembly line at your home so this 3d printing has also revolutionized the world this is the third phase now some writers say in magazines that no the fourth stage has started because of coming of artificial intelligence etc we do not know we are living in the third phase it it is possible that the fourth phase has started we don't know for now this is the end of the industrial revolution video now i want your opinion write down in comments what do you think do you think the benefits of industrial revolution outweigh its somber consequences like the destruction of the planet now we are a consumerist society we produce so much that is not even required so much of plastic waste has uh, clogged the oceans everything you see the pollution the environmental impact do you think it is all worth it comparing it to the benefits of the industrial revolution you have to write your points i want it in the comments let's see how good you are and this will be a question in mains trust me this is only how industrial revolution questions will be framed thank you for watching this video have a good day